Good afternoon. We have today 45 minutes and maybe 40 minutes. And I want to take this time to give you an overview of what branding in the hospitality industry is. So let's start with branding. When we speak about branding, a lot of people speak about logo, colors, tagline, and all those fluffy things that marketing people love. But from a business point of view, from a commercial point of view, why do we do branding? To charge a premium, right? We want to send, sell the same product or service for a higher price. We call this a brand premium, so this is why we do branding. Starbucks is the obvious example, right? We are ready to pay, I think in Lausanne it's now 5 90 for a tall latte for a coffee which, from a product point of view, is worth probably five cents. So what about the hospitality industry? What about hotels? How do we generate this premium, right? Because everybody gets it once we speak about coffee, and it, look, it seems normal that we can pay a higher price for coffee. But what about hotels? Hotels have a very particular way, or specific way, to approach building brand premium. What do they do? Interior design. Let's renovate the hotel. It's going to look amazing. And now we're going to have a brand. Right? Or they say, you know, we need a theme. So it's going to be about pirates. Or it's going to be about birds. And we're going to have uh, the eagle room and uh, the small eagle room. And we're going to have the nest uh, entrance. Right? Theme. So we put a very direct themes on hotel. Or the one, probably one of the favorite one, is to say, Let's have equipment. We're going to have a rain shower. We're going to have an iPad in all the rooms. And we're going to over-equip our rooms so we're going to have a brand and we'll be able to charge a premium. Or you do it the Hilton way. You just put a logo everywhere, from a pen to a napkin to a curtain to a towel. You put a logo on the thing, and you have a brand. Or you don't, right? There's a few problems with this, let's say, narrow approach. In the, in the world of hospitality is that it doesn't last. Let me give you a very simple example. This is a very basic study we did for a hotel group based in uh, London. They are called um, Cubic Hotel, and they had one hotel at the time that opened in 2007. This curve is the number of times uh, people look at it on Google. How, how often do people type cubic hotels? So a lot of people type cubic hotels when it opens. And you see the trend. And up, they open a new hotel in London. What does this mean? This means that you only have a brand, you only make the news, you are only visible if you open new real estate. How expensive is this from a brand building point of view? It's really bad, right? So, how do we go beyond that? Second thing is, you can copy design. You might have the super cool idea for that lobby, which is combined with the gym and the coffee house, and you have disco in the evening. Fine, we get it. The minute you do this, someone can copy it immediately. So the big question we have today, and I have three elements of answer, is to say, how do we move beyond the walls? How do we stop thinking in terms of, I need to, to fill those walls, those, those quadrat meters, in order to have a brand? How do we build a, hotel, a brand premium without thinking about hotel anymore, or at least the physical part of it? So there's three things we're going to cover. The first one is more of a generic uh, branding term, branding concept, is the idea of frame of reference. This is the most important branding concept. The second one is linked to what is exactly a hotel concept. So we're going to look at the framework which we use, which is the hotel concept framework. Last one is storytelling. What does it mean exactly to tell a story about a hotel? So let's start with the frame of reference. And I'd like to tell you a little story about this. Have you heard about this? This man, uh, I think he's about eight years old now. He took his cap, took his violin, and went down in the metro in Boston. Find a nice place, and he started to play. He played for about one hour. Most of the people didn't stop. A few stopped and listened, and even fewer gave him some money for the great play. At the end of the one hour of uh, playing violin, he made $25. So back then, 
one hour of playing for a street musician, $25 is actually a very good intake. Sounds, sounds like fair, right? Now there's a, there's a catch. This man is called Joshua Bell. Joshua Bell is one of the best violinists alive. The violin, is, the violin that he's using to play is cost itself $1.5 million. And just a few days back, he was playing in some big concert hall in the same city where the average price ticket was $300. So we have the same guy with the same violin playing the same song. But we've got a crazy difference in perceived value, right? Why is this? Because the frame of reference is not the same. Before, we had a street musician. We look at this guy from the angle of a street musician. So no matter how good he is, he's still going to be a street musician. Think about it in daily life. A secretary, no matter how good his or her opinion is, he's still going to be a secretary. And we're not going to judge the content. We judge the packaging, which is a very bad thing from a content point of view. And then he moved to an established artist. Why? You have to book your ticket in advance. You have to dress up with a tuxedo. You have to, you arrive, you get champagne. You, you have a seat reserved to you. You need to be quiet, switch off your phone. That's worth $300, right? So this is the fundamental idea behind branding, or at least the mechanism we can use in order to build a premium. So let me give you a very kind of basic example. This is a project we did about five, six years ago and uh, very, very low scale. It was in Geneva Lake, and, or Lake Léman, and um, this company was called Léman Loisir. So what you see in the back is actually the website of the company before we took over. We did not do the design. And the guy basically is renting boats. So you need to have a driving license for boats, right? And you pay a price up front, let's say, I think it's between three to 6,000 Swiss francs, and then you can use the boat based on, let's say, on Saturday evening, it's going to be more expensive than on a Monday morning, right? So you use kind of credits that you prepay. Business wasn't doing, doing well. And he said, look, I'm going to close the business. I've been doing this for 10 years. Numbers keep becoming bad. Can you help? We said, yes, we can. It's very easy, actually. It's very, very easy. You have the wrong frame of reference. You are today in location nautique, as we say in French, you like nautical leisure. So if you think about it, what's in the frame of reference of that type of leisure? You're going to have the paddle, the pedalo, and all those cheap things. This is a typical problem we have in marketing. We do two axes, plus, minus. As a consultant, you always say, you are here today. Thanks to our service, you're going to be here tomorrow, right? But you're still in the same frame. So you might be alone here being, we are the most expensive one, the one with an engine. I mean, it doesn't matter what the axes are. We are in the frame of leisure. This guy costs 25 francs an hour. This is minimum 3,000 bucks. So how do we shift the frame of reference? I say you need to shift the frame of reference to what we would call lifestyle investment. So Lémon Loisir, right, is no longer just some sort of leisure for lake leisure. It's a lifestyle investment. Okay, lifestyle investment, what is it exactly? Well, lifestyle investment is membership in the Golf Club de Genève, or it's being part of this uh, luxury car uh, sharing program, or it's actually renting a house in Ibiza for a month. Suddenly, with our access, we are the, the cheapest of all the options. So it's completely relative. Is it cheaper? Is it expensive? It depends who you talk to. So we can understand here that we are talking to a completely different type of clientele because we are not in the same frame of reference. We moved Joshua Bell out of the underground and we moved him in the concert hall. So that's a theory. So how does that work in practice? Well, before we were summer leisure doing rental with clients prepaid system. And fundamentally, this was for people who cannot afford to have their own boat. Now we've become a lifestyle. We've got a club of, we have a fleet of boats, actually. We've got members. We've got a membership tier system. And essentially, we are for people who want to have access to a fleet of boats. 
Do you have a driving license? Yes. Do you have a boat? No. Hmm. Do you have a driving license? Yes. Do you have a boat? No. But I'm a member of a club where I have access to a fleet of boats. You see how the linguistic around the same thing start to change. The image you have on the right is very different than the image you have on the left. So that's at the linguistic level. So when you move this to the picture level, you get a very different universe. Super cliche. It's not creative. It's completely expected. It's this typical wannabe Geneva money. But that's why it works, because this is exactly the people you want to get in that thing. So we're not trying to be the most creative one. We're just trying to be the most precise one with the frame of reference we are using. As a side story, you can see somewhere here. It says still lemonloisir.ch on the side of the boat. And it's the one of the first thing we told the client. We say, you need to take this out. And you say, why? It's very good. People see lemonloisir.ch, it's advertising. People know about the service. They need to come. I need client. We say, yes. But if you're an existing client, it's like if you rent a Ferrari and you're having a club, and it has the rental number plates. Everybody sees you at the club thinking, this guy doesn't, cannot have it. He's just, he's not a real one. When you have a rental boat in Geneva, you need to refuel. And at the end of the day out, you need to refuel because, well, you're a day user, right? So you have to refuel every day, every time you use it. And then you actually have to do this whole parking of the boat in front of La Nautique, which is like the posh restaurant for people who actually have a boat. So if you are there with a boat that basically is saying, I rent that boat, no good. We did more stuff. We developed all those visuals that shows the fleet of boats. That was extraordinary because the clients started to discuss the different boats. They say, oh, are you talking the Stingray 205? It has a very good engine, super stable. I love it for the family. Oh, no, I prefer the Rinker 3000. It's really powerful, not stable, but it has so much power. Great for jet ski. So suddenly, choosing which boat became a thing because we gave them the tool to discuss the fleet of boats. As a side uh, note, the, the sunset you see in the picture did not exist. This was fully photoshopped. And uh, the name Boat Club Geneva is the final name that was chosen. Again, not original, but exactly what is needed for this product. It still exists in the club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boat Club still exists, absolutely. And um, we had to change the name over two years because the thing was called Lemon Loisir for like 15 years. It's like telling a dad, you know what, the name of your kid? It's not that good. Change it. It's not going to happen overnight. So we had to do, phase it. First, call it Le Mans Loisir, Geneva Boat Club, and then do the, move the tagline to the, to the logo level. The result of this exercise was 30% increase in revenue. So you have a company that has been doing stable numbers for 10 years in a row. 10 years. We come in, and we don't touch the boats. We don't even need to put a foot in the boats. We just changed the frame of reference. And this is worth 30%. This is your Starbucks premium. So frame of reference. Before doing any hotel project or any hospitality related project, first understand in which frame of reference you are. Otherwise, you are just moving from one side of the axis without solving the fundamental problem. Once you understand this, you can start to look about at the concept. The second thing I would like to share with you today is what is a concept? Everybody speaks about hotel concept development, but what is it really, you know? The key is that a hotel concept starts with an idea. It's not about the walls. And if you think about, let's say, the concept everybody's talking about at the moment, Zoku in Amsterdam, which is connecting people with ID, or 25 Hours, which has been around for a few years now, it's the idea of we are mad in here. Right? Or maybe the idea of a generator hostel that was very, very good at making budget hotel or hostel cool again. So when you have your central idea, what does that actually mean for your hotel concept? Well, we use this nice flower, which uh, we call the hotel concept framework. And what, is, what, what it is basically saying is that a hotel concept, a brand experience or customer experience, no matter what you call it, is an aggregation of four different things. So most of the hoteliers today, they are only in that circle, the product. They change the facilities, they change the infrastructure, they change all of this. 
the most innovative hoteliers out there, they will start touching this. They'll say, you know, we need our staff to say aloha to the guests when they come in. You know, we need to uh, give them a welcome drink uh, when they leave, or goodbye drink. And that's it. That's how far this industry is stuck when it comes to hotel concept. So obviously, the mama shelter and the zoku of this world are making millions out of the incapacity of the whole market to actually come up with real concepts. I'm not saying nobody gets it. I'm saying the few that gets it reap all the benefits. So what are the two other things that need to be taken into account? Well, story. What is the story you tell about the hotel besides having walls and welcoming guests for business and leisure anytime we need them, right? And what are the channels you use? I'm not just talking about sales channel. Obviously, booking.com is part of it. I'm not just talking about social media channel. I'm also talking about analog channels. What type of event do you organize? But don't just say, oh, we organize this, and it's for Christmas, it's nice. But how does that connect to the story you're telling? Or how does this connect to the infrastructure? Because hotels are very good at doing a lot of initiatives. You know, we're going to have a, a day at the spa where kids are welcome. Or, you know, we are going to organize a flea market in the courtyard. Or we're going to have a Christmas uh, evening with um, glue vine for the locals. Fine, all good initiatives probably push the numbers a little bit the month it happens. But how does this build your brand? How is this connected to your infrastructure? Is this even relevant to your infrastructure? So I'm going to give you an example to really make this concrete. And it's actually a project we worked on, but we didn't get, which means it's a project we were pitching on in Paris. And uh, unfortunately, we are not the chosen company to develop the concept. So I'm showing you basically the slides that we used to pitch. And um, actually, having spoken with them recently, they regret that we didn't win. But anyway. Um, so this is a project done by Ele Elegancia Group in Paris. They are a small boutique operator. They have about 20, 25 hotels. And uh, they wanted to do that hotel. They have done it, the hotel on uh, the river, La Seine, in Paris. And uh, so it's quite an innovative thing. And I say, you know, we're going to put that thing. It's fully custom made. We need branding for that. What do we do? And I say, well, first we need, we need a central idea, right, before we start coming up with a logo design, like most of you would do. So what could be the idea? We say, well, if we look at it, there's three axes which are interesting. The first one is it's about living on water, which is the idea of being captain, it's a beach club, it's a yacht club. Or you could say, no, it's about it's an urban oasis. You know, it's slightly disconnected. It's like a peninsula in Paris, right? It's not fully part of the city. It's disconnected. It's like a retreat, a sanctuary, a spa, a refuge. Or we say, no, no, no. It's more about hacking the city. Because in order to be there, it's like you cannot build anything in Paris. The city is full. But then you come by waterway, pack, you're in the center of the city. So you're hacking the system. So you are like, are you a rebel, a criminal, a mafiosi, a hippie? So you see those three columns, they open up completely different mental pictures. So before we start discussing what our marketing activity on Tuesday morning, we might want to fix that. What are we? Are we the pirate hotel or the yacht club? That's quite different. So we identify three direct, four directions that for them could be actually interesting, being from some that are quite progressive to some that are more uh, conservative, some more uh, budget-friendly, some more luxury, because everything was open at that time. And uh, we said, well, we could do a yacht club. It's the most expected thing to do, but you can do it. Uh, you could do something linked to rebel luxury. You could have a bohemian house, or you could have free spirit. So already in those four ideas, you have very different yeah, images that, that, that come to it. You might think, oh, rebel luxury. I like to go there. You think, oh, what is this? I don't want to be part of this. So you're already segmenting a bit your clientele there. So what does this mean? What does this mean operationally speaking? Right? Because now we are the concept level, right? Tagline, so to speak, positioning. Now you move down to operation, right? Utterly are very down to earth. So we made these little charts for them. We use three of the four examples and we say, what could happen for breakfast? What could happen for the signature drink, right? What could happen for F&B? What could happen for the boat transfer? And what could happen for the key activities? 
So let me pick just a few so you get it. For instance, if we're in a free spirit hotel, the activities are about games all together as a community in the swimming pool and we do morning yoga. But if we're in the luxury rubble, the only use of the, of the pool is to do party and probably poker night. Or what about F&B? Well, as a luxury rubble, we're going to do burger with caviar. We're going to mix that classic thing. But you know, if we free spirit, why not bring Grand Mackey and some uh, I know, a candy bar? Suddenly, your little operational choice are linked to a central ID. So this becomes your compass, your navigator. Instead of saying, oh, shall we do a burger with caviar? Yes, yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. Free spirit, bam. You don't make those choices anymore. You try to link it. So every single thing you do in the hotel, from serving a welcoming drink to doing a pickup, uh, boat pickup transfer with a client, is actually building your brand equity. That's how you build a brand. Otherwise, you're just running a hotel. So let's go even a step further and say, OK, that's fine. We get how this can impact operational level. So how does this impact visual, right? I spoke to you at the beginning about logo. I'm not speaking about logo here, but this is just a rough mock-up. This is free spirit. Life is short. Be bold. Be you. Be playful. Enjoy simple pleasure. Never look back. Don't take yourself too seriously. Love to the balls. Free spirit. You might like it. You might hate it. That's the whole point. You are creating emotions compared to this thing. We're not speaking about the size of the room. We're not speaking about the number of facilities. We're not speaking about the access to the airport. We're not speaking about the product. We are just speaking about the idea behind it. So how would that look if we were luxury rebel? We made our money by following our passions. We wear colorful socks instead of ties. We hate, we hate luxury hotels where everybody is stiff and stuck up. We want an exclusive place with a cool factor. Welcome to the luxury rebel hotel. We haven't touched the place. As far as I'm concerned, the interior design could almost be the same. In an ideal world, you would obviously make the interior design work with that story. But even if you, even if you haven't, you are sending a completely different message to your customers. And the good thing is that when you have a story like this, you don't need a new hotel to get visibility and speak about yourself. you get the news because you have something to tell to the world, which is beyond we change our soap brand and we have a partnership with a local restaurant for our fruits. You suddenly standing for something. So this leads more into the storytelling part. I give you already some element of storytelling, but I would like to give you some much more precise example. Um, starting with um, a project we have done about I think three or four years ago in Paris. This was the first hotel project we had in Paris. And it is the one that launched the business there. Which means before that, I had barely been in Paris. Now I'm going every week. Because since we've done that one hotel, we are getting all the market. This hotel was, and still is, called Le Terrasse Hotel. It's in Montmartre. So for the one who know Paris, this is in the 18th arrondissement. And it's the artist neighborhood in Paris. And uh, well, judge by yourself, this was the hotel. You see the interior design style, you see the logo. All right, old school, right? We young to a family, they own five hotels in Paris. We deal directly with the owner. They say, look, we have two options. Either we sell or we do something with it. But you know what? We don't know what to do with it. So we say, you know, let's get that big idea first. Let's get that story going, right, before we start discussing the size of the rooms. And, um, we use with them what is our, our tool, which I will not present to you today, but I would definitely in more extended presentation, is what we call the brand story canvas. It's a tool we use to deconstruct a story. And um, based on this work we did with the owner, but also with our own research, we came back with a very simple, let's say, brand platform or brand structure. It's saying we have three themes. Themes are very important in branding. I'll come back to this. Uh, the first one is about family heritage. The second one is about artistic spirit. And the last one is about 
this village feel that you have in Montmartre. Montmartre even has its own president. You know, it's a village within a city. And at the middle of this, it creates something. It's l'adresse des artistes depuis 1911. This is very interesting because l'adresse links to the idea of the village, right? It's the place in a village. Des artistes, the esprit d'artiste. Since 1911, links to the heritage. And it means that it has been here for so long time, and it's still going to be here in the future because we are the place where artists go. How did we reach that? We looked at all the archive, and we find out so much, much stuff about famous people who stayed in a hotel and uh, famous people who lived in the neighborhood. And we say, how can we bring this at the hotel level? So the, what does this hotel stand for? This hotel stands for the, the place that welcomes artists. It doesn't matter what the decoration is. So we wrote the story. And I'm going to read it out to you because it's a bit difficult, I think, to read. It's in French. Uh, it says, Comédien, peintre, bourgeois bohème ou artisan, l'esprit d'artiste de Montmartre s'exprime à tous les coins de rue. Contemporain de Dali, Matisse, Renoir, Edith Piaf ou encore Jacques Prévert, le terrasse hôtel a toujours été l'adresse des artistes. C'est donc tout naturellement que le nouveau terrasse s'inspire de leur univers artistique pour sa rénovation. So we're giving context. Remember, we move Joshua Bell from being a street musician to the concert hall. We're moving the Terrace Hotel to, from being one hotel in Montmartre to being the center place of artists for more than a century. It's no longer about the walls. It's about those artists coming together in one place. Once we have this idea and we have our themes, we can start to work on a visual identity. It's actually a picture that was taken in one of the early workshops we had uh, with the design team to come up with some sorts of concepts. You know, visually, what do we say? And you know, when you have a base story, it's so easy to, to design because we're no longer discussing, you like red, I like yellow, let's do orange, it's in between. You have very clear compass. You know where you want to go, you know what the story is, you know what the themes are. So you just try to make, to make that visually happen. You know, you just try to translate the story into visuals. You're no longer trying to make something that looks cool and luxurious. You're trying to tell the story of the address of the artist since 1911. And this is even more helpful when it comes to renovation. And we had the chance to really be early on in the project and to be working closely with the interior designer to develop the, the design. And this is one of the first rendering, uh, 3D rendering, we got from the designer. And say, look, this is the vision I have for your hotel. This is what I'm going to do. We say, hmm, what do we, what do we reply to this? Well, let's think. We l'adresse des artistes depuis 1911. Does this look like it's here since 1911? Nah, it looks like a luxury penthouse in New York. Industrial style with the bricks. Looks good. You might like it. I might like it. It's not telling the story we want to tell. So the designer can work on this and say, you know, let's bring those historical elements, la rosace that you put on the ceiling, you know, to give a bit of cachet to the, to the building. And then let's come up with stuff that are inspired by the world of artists without being too obvious, right? We're not doing Disneyland. We're not doing a theme hotel. We're just referring to that world. So then we can get a mock-up room, right? Mock-up room is the one room you do before doing the 100 others to check everything. This is what we got. It worked better. You see now we have included some nice detail, this uh, verrier d'artiste at the back. But there were some details that were still too clashing, too obvious, you know. It's not subtle enough. Oh, it's about the artist, so we put a photography box in it. First degree. We never want to do first degree in branding. And then he, he puts like a neon light in the back of the moulure. If you have a building, typical Haussmann style in Paris, you don't have a neon behind the, the moulure, right? So, you know what? Let's remove it. And the designer like it because we're not saying, I don't like it, remove it. We say, it's not matching the story we're telling. So it's no longer about our emotions or our taste. It's a rational discussion. And this is the final room. So you see the rosette that has been put at the top. We've got all the little moulures. We've got the, this, this was changed. We've got the little detail that reminds of the world of artists without saying, we are in large artists. Uh, this is actually a cinema chair inspired by, but it's not a cinema chair. It looks a bit like one, so we're not trying to make a pastiche, right? 
And uh, yeah, I mean, people like it, people don't like it from an interior design point of view. Irrelevant. It's coherent with the story we're telling. So when we're saying we are the address of the artist since 1911, people buy it. And when I say people are, buy it, I mean first the press and then the audience. And this is an extract of the press kit we prepared for them. Because once you have all of that story, you need to go out. We live in a world where everybody says there's a conversation between, there's a dialogue. There's no longer a one-way dis discussion between a brand and an audience, but there's a dialogue. Yes, but, true, but, but wrong, because there is a dialogue. But who speaks first? Me as a brand, I speak first. How can you speak back if you don't know what I'm talking about? So this is something incredible that brands have as a, as a power. They have the power to set the frame of reference. People might like it or might not like it, but they will be criticizing you on what you have given them, not on what they invented. So we basically said, this hotel is the legend of Montmartre, which is reopening. We are the most iconic hotel in the neighborhood. We are marking the entrance of Montmartre like a tower, and we've been the place where the artists have been here forever. And now we are reopening. Join us. So this is the information that was sent to the press. Just a few weeks after the opening, we get this from the Wall Street Journal. So you have the Wall Street Journal, which is basically buying your story. They're just telling it. And there's nothing better than when someone tells you a story instead of you telling your story. That's when you move from advertising to PR. You no, you no longer need to advertise yourself. Someone is doing the job for you. There's been a lot of press coverage that all go in the same direction from, uh, uh, I mean, Elle, Vogue, uh, Vanity Fair. Everybody has been covering the hotel the same way. And uh, this is the final result where amazing view of our Paris. We advise on the development of the restaurant. Uh, other picture of the room. This is the logo we've developed. Uh, to give it an artist feel, right? But very contemporary. The average rate moved from 180 euro to 230 euro. So it's not like the case of the boat where only branding made the difference. Obviously, the rooms are nicer, right? The Wi-Fi works faster, the staff has been retrained. So we cannot say the premium is only the brand. But big part of the premium comes from the fact that the Wall Street Journal is telling those stuff about you. If you're a Chinese customer and you read this, you don't need to go on booking.com and think, oh, you know, we should go to this one, it's 10 euro less. You want to be in the place where the artists have been since the 1911, in the heart of Montmartre, the city of the artists, right? So when I present this case, people tend to like it, but they also say, that's fine, but it's an easy case, right? You have a hotel that's 100 years of history, you in Montmartre, so it's easy to build a story, right? You just need to arrange it. Fair. To an extent, it's fair. So how do we build a story when there is no history? So let me show you a last example that was going to be to finish up today of a project we're working on at the moment in Paris uh, where there is zero history. Uh, this is the state of the building as we speak, or well, a few months back. So we are in Saint-Martin. It's the 10th arrondissement. So it's a very upcoming neighborhood. Uh, it used to be a neighborhood for, let's say, criminal and prostitutes 50 years ago, and now it's becoming the hipster place with a, a bobo a vélo and a coiffeur afro, as I call them. And uh, it used to be, long, to be an office. Nothing special about the building except, well, it has a nice courtyard, right? So the client came to us and said, look, we're going to do a hotel. Uh, it's going to be independent. What do we do? We said, OK, we, uh, what about your history? Uh, there's nothing. We have this one paper about the history of the building. It says when we bought it 10 years ago. There's nothing else. Good luck. So we look at the neighborhood. We look at the street. There's nothing. There's nothing we can do around it. So we thought, OK, we need a starting point. The starting point in this case is not the neighborhood and nice artistic spirit. The starting point is the concept of the building. This is a view from the top of the building. You see there's one main entrance which opens up to a lot of services. So what does this remind you of? A Roman loggia? A military camp? 
or medieval castle is the same concept. You think we are protected from the entire world. There's only one entrance. But once you come in, everything opens up. So there's something very interesting conceptually here. I'm not talking about the size of the wall. I'm just thinking about the idea behind it. The hotel itself is located on a very quiet street, so we don't get a lot of uh, uh, walk-ins. So we need to tell a story that, that works with that location, which is good overall, but not good at a micro level, on the street level. So we say, we need to become, I'm going to say it in French, un havre citadin. In a place like Paris, where it's so bustling and everybody's always on moving to one place to the next, getting on strike, getting stuck in traffic, we're going to be a Havre citadin, an urban haven in Saint Martin. And why in Saint Martin? Because Saint Martin is a neighborhood that is changing so much. But who is becoming the ambassador of that change? Who is representing that new way of living in Paris? Nobody. We are. We are the self proclaimed ambassador of the new Saint Martin. And uh, so you see a bit the, big, the, the bigger uh, uh, plan, and you see the three themes we have, villégiature urbaine, the idea that you can have leisure time in a city, we, we focus on this, the idea of cultural melting pot, and the idea of source of creativity. So it's never about the artists, it's about the designers, it's about the photographers, it's about the copywriters, it's about the translators. Those people are in that neighborhood. So we need to tell a story that works for them as well. And uh, the result, so to speak, or at least as, as the project stands at this stage, is called Le Grand Quartier. Le Grand Quartier because Saint Martin is becoming a Grand Quartier. It's becoming a, a, a neighborhood worth attention. Le Grand Quartier because it refers to all this history of the Grand Boulevard uh, uh, that you have in Paris. There's so many words with Grand. And Le Grand Quartier is also that place where we're not a hotel, there's a hotel in it, but there's also a cafe, there's meeting studios, there's a rooftop, there's a gym, there's a huge courtyard. We're gonna do free market on the Sundays. Why? Because we're the Grand Quartier. We are the face of the 10th arrondissement, and in particular of Saint Martin. And uh, the design uh, that has been developed reflects that. This would never work in Montmartre, this would never work in, uh, I don't know, in Mayfair in London but it worked because it's completely 10th arrondissement as a spirit. You can see here some of the um, uh, interior design we're working with um, Nice Makers. It's an um, uh, Amsterdam-based uh, interior design, and they did the rooms of the Hoxton. And uh, we are basically uh, we are working with them on this project, which is going to come out at the end of the year. So yeah, that's it for today. Uh, there's three things I present to you, just as a summary. Frame of reference, start by knowing in which category you belong. Second, uh, hotel concept, think about integrating all those elements and not just doing things. They need to have a common denominator. Number three, build a story, whether you have history or you don't. Yeah, and that's it. I think timing-wise, we are at 43 minutes, so I'll finish now, and thank you very much.